Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see so clearly. And hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me. All my stains washed away, they washed away. All right, before you sit down, I want everybody to turn around, say hi to somebody you don't know. I guarantee there are people you don't know here today. So find them, give them a brotherly kiss, all that good stuff, you know, the kind that's not dirty. And then say hello, and then we'll talk some more. Kathy, you spent enough time with Devry already. Sit down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's some trouble right there. That's all I know. <laughs> all right. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Casey Triplett. I'm one of the elders here. And even though I misbehave a little bit, we have a lot of fun. So uh, one of the things I love about Crossroads is, and I tell a lot of stories about the young adults group that I get to meet with, because it is just a blast. And Friday night, we only had a couple, couple young men there, and we were able to really dive into some of the things that men struggle with, which was a lot of fun. And it tied directly into the Bible study that we were doing. So it was a good time to see how growth is happening in the young people in our church. And so I want to share that with you, because that's some of those things that I love, is how um, we're really starting to focus on some of that as a church and really... Uh, get on to the young people and love them the right way. So uh, thank you for letting us do that. In your bulletins, which I don't have up here, but the funny little thing that Kathy gave you when you came in, uh, you'll find a connection card. If you were new and you want to fill out the connection card and you want to go give it to the funny looking guy in the blue shirt back there, he will give you a little welcome gift um, so you don't forget us and you can come back and see us again. If you have anything else to say, if you want to put a prayer request, change your address, just send a note to the elders, send a note to Steve, send a note to Bill, whatever you want to do, fill it out, put it in the offering plate as it goes by, and we'll be more than happy to get a hold of you and work through that. Um, upcoming events and opportunities. Yesterday, we did our work at the Wolves. That's what I'm going to call it. And uh, <laughs> I get, it was a huge success, guys. A lot of fun. We made some major progress. Everybody wanted to do it again. So we're going to do it again in September. I believe it is the 16th, so kind of plan on that. I'm sure there'll be a sign-up sheet coming out uh, shortly that we can start getting signed up for that and make plans, but that should be plenty of notice. Clear your schedule, plan to go out there and uh, have some fun labor, and probably be a little bit cooler, too. So 101 days of critical outreach is going, guys. We've been doing this. We've got a bunch of things. So I'm going to read you all of them so you can get caught up if you're behind. The first one is to tell somebody Jesus loves them. Real simple, right? Somebody gives you your coffee at the coffee stand. You say, just want you to know Jesus loves you, and you drive away. Brighten their whole day, right? Second one, invite somebody to church. A little scarier. My son did that this week. That was awesome. Uh, quote scripture to somebody in a conversation it means you have to learn scripture so you can quote scripture that's how it works tell someone what God is doing in your life and go out and enjoy God's creation go play in the woods and talk to a squirrel I think is what Steve was talking about there um, express God's love to providing something to someone work at the wolves something like that anything you can do to share God's love and new coming up this week that we're starting tomorrow or today if you can work it in today ask about church do they go where what what do you think of church which then would go back to number three and invite them if they want to come. <laughs> kind of ties right into that, right? So August 26th, we have the women's breakfast coming up. It is not the 18th. Kathy decided to be as ornery as she could and just change everything around and confuse everybody. So it will be the 26th. So ladies, write that down. Put it in your phone, whatever you need to do. August 27th, which is the Sunday, we will have a brief business meeting. And it will be quick. There's no voting. So if you even just attend here and you're not a member yet, 
you want to come see some of the exciting stuff, we have a couple pretty uh, good size announcements we want to talk about and just kind of get some feelers out there before we have our big business meeting. So, um, And then we have on the 26th, in that, I forgot to mention this part, in that uh, women's breakfast, we are doing a diaper party for Kathy, and she's getting up in her years. Um, she, oh, oh, sorry, Kathy. It's for Rainy. She's having a baby. We want to make sure that we uh, get her set up to take care of that uh, beautiful baby we're going to have. So make sure you plan for that too as well, ladies, to come with uh, some diapers and things. And then in the fall, some of the things that we have starting up in September will be a new Wednesday night, Crossroads Unplugged. So we're going to do kind of a mini service, a lot less electronics, a lot simpler, a lot more kind of just chill and old school. And then uh, Celebrate Recovery is starting back up. 612 is splitting high school and middle school, which will be really good because they'll be able to learn faster more and be a little more um, age appropriate. And life groups will be starting back up. So we got lots of things going, guys. Be prepared for that. With that, though, I will bring forward the men for the tithes and the offerings. Dear Heavenly Father, it's such a blessing, Lord, for us to be able to uh, gather in your house, Lord, freely to worship you. Uh, to spend time with you in worshiping and laughter and joy and to listen to your word, Father. I would just ask you to open our hearts and minds. You put us in a place where we get what you have for us today, Lord, that we grow from it, that we can uh, go out into the community, Lord, and share who you are. Lord, I ask you to bless these tithes and offerings that they would be used in the way that best benefits your kingdom. In your precious son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh 
blood of the Lamb and the word of thy testimony, everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of thy testimony,
Please give it up for the worship team, especially when they <laughs> sung a song that was one of my requests. So thank you, Jason, for doing that. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you. And Lord, I just pray that right now you would help us to empty ourselves of anything that's not of you, uh, any distractions or worries or fears that we have. Help us, Lord, to just cast them upon you and and just to be able to take in what the Spirit has to say to each and every one of us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Pastor Steve, as you know, is in the Air National Guard, and he's doing a couple weeks of active duty. So he was preaching there today. And he had asked me a couple weeks ago, if you can dim the lights, by the way, Tim. You did? There's lights everywhere. Can you turn some more off? Is that okay? People won't go to sleep if I turn them off. I just, I've heard from a lot of people they can't really see the slides when the lights are on. So... Anyway, Steve will be back, uh, not next week, but the week after, so I'll be preaching this week, next week. And I actually, as you know, if you've been here for a while, I've preached a lot on eschatology, pre-trib rapture, just things of that nature. I can preach on other things, I promise you. (laughs) I was going to do a series on the book of Philemon, but I thought, actually, some people had asked me if I could do just a little update on some things, so I thought I would do that. I'm going to teach a life group in the fall, and we'll probably cover a full book of the Bible. You're going to see me doing this a lot. Steve's face is a little bit wider than mine, and so he has stretched this thing out a lot. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep bending and, and doing that. So those previous sermons, if you didn't have a chance to hear them or you want to hear them again, you can go on Facebook or YouTube, pay me 19.95, and I'll, I'll let you to do that. So you can't copy them. I have them copyrighted. No, I'm only kidding. So today, we're going to do uh, kind of the signs of the times, and I'm only going to kind of cover from 2015 to 2017. And my hope from this sermon is that you're encouraged. I hope that you come out of this and say, man, we're kind of living in biblical times right now, right? There's some things happening. I don't want you to come out of this in fear, right? Or we don't serve a God of fear. Or s- I hope this doesn't get too distracting. Maybe I should have put the tape on here. What do you think, Rob? He's the one who talked me out of it, so. Um, You know, we serve a God who doesn't want us to be in fear. He wants us to be... Actually, if someone could get me a piece of tape, (laughs) it's going to drive me crazy. So, we serve a God that wants us to be free in the spirit, but our God, the only God, the only true God, our awesome God, as we sang, knows the future, right? He knew to him a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. He knows what's coming in the future, And he tells his people, even as he said with uh, Abraham, of course I'm going to tell someone so close to me. Thank you. After two seconds, you won't be looking at this anymore. So, yeah, that's okay. All right, thank you. So, you know, with God, he wants us to know what's going to happen so that it encourages us and so that we're prepared, right? Because we need to be spiritually prepared for the things that are happening in life. So, I and Steve tend to lean towards a pre-trib rapture of the church. That doesn't mean the church isn't going to go through terrible persecution. It already is. Right now in the rest of the world, right, the, the church is facing terrible persecution. But I can tell you that the end is very near because in 1 Corinthians 15.52, in the King James Version, it says that at the last Trump, then Jesus will come. Uh, who's, pre- who's president right now? Trump. So you know that, Okay. You have to read that in the King James. All right. So this is going to be a two-part series. Um, I actually tried to design it to be a a little bit short because the last couple Sundays, as you know, it's been desperately hot in here. And today's a little bit nicer, so I thank God for that. So I'm just going to, you know, if you're wanting to study more on this, I want to encourage you. I mean, there's so much to study, but some of the most key verses are Matthew chapter 24, Ezekiel chapter 38, 39, Good to see you, Jason. He was just raising his hand. Every <laughs> Checking the air conditioner. Uh, Daniel, all Daniel, but mostly Daniel chapter 29. Of course, the book of Revelations, First and Second Thessalonians. Those are some key uh, scriptures that you would want to study if you're, if you're really interested in this. But today we're going to do Matthew 24, and at some point Steve will wind up hitting this again because he's in the book of Matthew. This is a week before Jesus is crucified, okay? And he's sitting on the... Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's just had the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, and now his, he's talking to his disciples, and they say, aren't these, te- the temple is beautiful. It was overlaid in gold, and, and if I've been there, 
you know, you can see that area from the Garden of Gethsemane on a bright day. I'm sure the, the temple was glowing. And, and Jesus says, hey, I tell you, not one stone's going to be left on top of another. He gives them a short-term prophecy. And 40 years later, when the, the Jews rebel against the Romans, the Romans attack, the temple gets set on fire. After the fire, all the gold is melted. The Roman soldiers disassemble all the stones to get the gold. So that prophecy was fulfilled. So a little bit later... Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. His disciples come to him and say, tell us, when will all this happen? You notice how it says came to him privately? Jesus isn't doing a public teaching on this to everybody because he shares with his people what's going to happen. But like a parable for people who are rejecting that he's telling them that he is the Messiah and all his miracles, he's not going to give other people the deeper things of God until they're ready to accept the most basic things of God, that he is the Messiah. The disciples say, tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of, and I have in bold, because these, these are the things that we're going to examine, wars and rumors of wars, or wars and threats of wars. But don't panic. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold and the good news about the kingdom will be pre preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. False messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. Just as the gathering of vultures shows there's a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. You know, there's another verse where Jesus says, only an adulterous and evil generation asks for a sign. But you have to understand, at that point, he had been preaching and teaching for several years. He had raised people from the dead. He had healed the lame. He had walked on water. He had fed 5,000, 10,000. He had done all these things and was proclaiming to them that he was, he was letting them know, I am the Messiah. They said, nobody has ever preached God's word like he does. And then you had some like the Pharisees who say, show us a sign. Really? After all of that, you want a sign? And he said, the only sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah, that I'll be three days in the belly of the beast. He was talking to them. That's evil for you to ask for a sign. After all I've done, you're, you're still rejecting me as Messiah. But as a Christian, as a believer who trusts in God, God gives us signs and he gives us things to look for. Right to signal. And he, he doesn't rebuke his disciples. He tells them, I will show you these things. So I just wanted to be clear on that. So let's start with what Jesus is saying here with the wars and rumors of wars. I don't think I have to spend too much time on this. In the last hundred years, since World War I, we'll just use that as a starting point, 1914, so 103 years ago, more people have been killed in warfare than in all of human history combined in warfare up to this point, up to that point. Right? Terrible wars, multi-millions of people. Do you realize in the Revolutionary War that lasted for quite a few years where America gained its independence? We only lost 4,000 people, and I don't mean to be trivial. Any loss is terrible, but you know, this great war of independence against the strongest nation in the world, you know, we lost 4,000 of our um, fellow men and women who were fighting. But since World War I, and you can't turn the news on, there's warfare throughout the entire world. And even right now, we're sitting here with our leaders wondering, what do we do with this nation of North Korea threatening to, you know, nuke the United States or to, you know, I'm going to just, I'll digress a little. I'm just going to ask you to really pray for our leaders. There are no good choices. But, you know, if you look at Kim Jong-un and his father and grandfather who've ruled that nation, like that uh, first verse, they, they declare themselves as gods. They're not just leaders, but they're gods to be worshipped. Their pictures are everywhere. People have to worship them. This is an affront to God, and God, when he deals with people like this in history, usually comes to a point where he says, I'm done with you. The writing's on the wall. And this might be that time, but we, you know, for the North Korean people, there's a lot of people who've become Christians in North Korea. Right? We don't have any beef with them, but a lot of them are in prisons. We should be praying that God somehow intervenes in this, that it doesn't lead to a terrible war where the United States, Japan, South Korea, whatever. So I just digress a little. Pray for your leaders for wisdom for them and that God moves in a mighty way so that people can see he's judging this man and, and taking care of that issue. 
On another note, how do people in North Korea, this nation that is walled off basically, South Korea is experiencing a revival. There's a lot of believers in South Korea. And you have people going to the border on certain days when the wind's blowing, they attach just one page of scripture to a balloon and they send it across the border. And there's stories of people in North Korea being saved by just finding one uh, scripture, you know, one page of scripture. Chinese who are facing their own persecution are sneaking into North Korea and finding ways to try to share the gospel with them. So, yes, they're a threat to us, but we need to be praying as well. Number two, Russia and China, they've never been big actors in the Middle East, never really involved in there, but now they're firmly ensconced. I mean, if you're following the war in Syria, Russia is firmly ensconced in there. China now has bases over there. This isn't hitting the news a lot, but now they've sent some troops. They've established bases in Africa, and in one case, they've set up a base in the country of Djibouti, not too far from where our base is, right? So if you read Revelation and Ezekiel 38, you know that at some point, this northern nation of Russia and the Chinese army or the, or the kings of the east are going to converge in the Middle East. God tells us at some point this is going to happen. Right, so now they have bases there and things are already kind of lining up. When you read those verses in Ezekiel 30, whatever, and they refer to Persia, the Bible's always going to use the ancient names. Persia is modern day Iran. Okay, so if you're reading that, know that they're talking about the country of Iran today. Typically, they've always been um, enemies with Russia, now they're allies, which in Ezekiel 38 makes it look like that's what had to happen. And last, uh, more Christians have been killed in persecution in the last hundred years than in the 1900 years since Stephen, the first martyr, was killed. So in America right now, you know, we're facing some persecution at work, um, you know, people slamming us, things that we see on TV, you know, trying to find entertainment for our kids that isn't anti-Christian. I don't know how young parents do it today. It's very hard, but we haven't gotten to that point yet of being you know, thrown in prison or, or killed for our faith. Yet, we don't know what the future holds. But while we have this freedom, we need to take full advantage of it. Next, Jesus said there'd be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, right? It, you know, if you follow the news, you know there's always famines going on uh, throughout Africa and other countries. You know, the, the crops are failing. We've got fish dying by the billions. You know, they don't understand why that's happening. Uh, we've had the tsunami and the earthquakes in Japan, uh, that tsunami that hit in, the, in Asia, how long has that been now, 10 years, whatever, that was so powerful of an earthquake that created that, that it actually shook the world and it threw us off in alignment with the satellites in space to where they had to recalculate the, that's how powerful that was. And that was just part of the birth pains that Jesus talked about. But over here, this, if you could see this, I know it must be difficult to see it in the back, but it's just showing from 1950 up till 2020, this is the occurrences of earthquakes, and now this is since, you know, 1980, how it's going up. And lately, it's just been earthquakes everywhere. If, my brother-in-law actually has a tracker on his phone. He's all excited to show us, look at all the new earthquakes today that are happening. You know, I, I wouldn't want to be in one. I'm glad I don't live on a fault line, but we don't know what's going to happen with, uh, throughout the rest of the country. Jesus also said, many will turn away from me. And I'm going to spend a couple of the slides talking about this. Paul, in his letter to Timothy, says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some will turn away from the true faith, they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. Jesus, being God, already knew. You've got to remember, at the time that Jesus said, many will turn away from me, he had maybe a total of 500 disciples. You know, he had people, 70 that kind of followed him, and then he had the inner 12. But he was already telling us that it was going to be a worldwide phenomenon of the gospel being spread and that people following him. 2,000 years later, right, the gospel has spread. Our God knew that. He wasn't just some upstart who wanted to be somebody and then faded away into history. But he was already predicting that many would turn away from him. I did a sermon on apostasy, so I'm not going to get... Uh, too deep into this, but I'm going to tell you right now, the great apostasy that Paul was also talking about, I believe we're in it. Now, if that, let's say the great apostasy lasts 15 years, I don't, I think we're in the beginning of it. I think it's going to get worse, 
and this is my opinion, you can you know, doubt me on this, but I believe that we're already in it, and these are going to be some of the reasons why. This, I had to tailor this down. I had so many headlines, I just randomly picked four. Uh, UK government demands, I won't say the word for the sake of the kids, in Christian seminaries, July 24th. Right? The Church of England, the Anglican Church, which is big in Africa, and that's the Episcopal Church in America, they're saying, hey, you've got to teach this in the Sunday schools and in the seminaries. All the pastors have to come out prepared to accept this sinful thing that God says is wrong. March 2015, Presbyterian Church votes to redefine marriage, joining the Evangelical Lutheran Church, the Episcopal Church, you, you name it. So many of the churches now are creating their own, um, basically, prayer books for same-sex marriage, for the ordination of, of, of pastors and stuff that are homosexual. Southern Baptists go gender-inclusive. This kind of caught me by surprise just in June. They're feeling like they need to be a little more tolerant, so they're going to take the Bible and take out any references to God being in the masculine. And then the Church of Sweden, which again, the, the Swedish Lutheran Church is the state church. It says, that, man, if you're going to be a pastor, you have to be willing to do these kind of marriages, whatever. This is Christian Europe and America, right? Christian Europe that sent out missionaries all over the world is now, they, they estimate about 2% born-again Christians of the whole population, right? China and these other countries, South Korea, have much higher percentages of believers. Right now, that's apostasy. When you're half your churches are teaching things that people should be coming to church to hear and allow the Holy Spirit to convict them of sin, they're being told in half the churches that this is okay. As a matter of fact, those who preach otherwise are the sinful ones. Jesus said, those people will hate you in the future, saying that they're your brothers. So this is where we're, we are right now. Just as an aside, you know, we know from the news that we have, there's a lot of Muslims coming into Europe. That's where the conversions are happening. A lot of these Muslims now finally, for the first time, tasting freedom. And, and they're like, we don't know what to do, because they're, they're not used to having new converts ever come to their churches. So we should be praying for that too. There are American and Canadian missionaries over in Europe who are directly you know, related to and, and working with the Muslims coming in and they're turning to Christ by the thousands. We should pray that that continues. Jesus said that sin will be rampant everywhere. Right? This is what I grew up with, but if I had kids today, I wouldn't be <laughs> letting them watch these TV programs. Everything that was... Evil is now called good. Everything that was good is now called evil. You can't see this very well. It's not showing up, but it says drug overdoses and motor vehicle accidents. You know, we used to have like 40,000 people killed a year in motorcycle or on motor vehicle accidents. Now it's gone down quite a bit with the safety programs. Now we're up to about 50,000 people a year dying from opioid abuse, right? And that doesn't include all the other drug abuse that's going on. I'm, I'm not here to condemn anyone today. That's never been an issue in my life, right? But I know for a lot of people, uh, drug use, uh, being hooked on that, Satan uses that as one of his most powerful weapons to get people. And I'm going to tell you right now, you know, rebuke that in your life. If Satan's coming at you with that, you know, join together with other believers, go to celebrate recovery, surround yourself with other believers because that is a, a, obviously a most powerful thing. Yesterday, I had the opportunity, as a matter of fact, Casey was talking about the 101 critical days. I would prayed the day before God, all right, you, well, yeah, I need to do something this week. And I get a call, hey, this guy in the jails, Lincoln County Jail is getting released. He needs a ride down to the town of Harrington. I said, I'll do it. So early Saturday morning, I pick him up. I was the one who put him in jail three weeks earlier. Um, he's, I won't mention his name, but he's in his 20s. And he got in the car and he said, boy, on a Saturday morning, 7 o'clock, thank you, you know, for doing this. And I said, the only reason I'm doing this, I'm a Christian. I would just like to be in bed like anyone else, but I'm a Christian and I'm, and I'm going to do this because God loves you. And he started talking about how recently he'd been hearing the gospel and he, he says he accepted Christ. I'll take him at that. But he goes, I'm going to share something with you I haven't shared with anyone else. He goes, I've been sticking needles in my neck with heroin. He goes, I, I'm killing myself. And he goes, that three weeks you put me in jail? I feel great today. He goes, I could, he could see God's hand in this, in that he was put there to get three weeks of sobriety. And he's like, now I'm scared because I'm out today and I'm afraid of the temptation. So we prayed together, you know, that, that he would be able to resist in the power of God. And I told him, you got to get hooked up with other believers. 
just this stuff is that this is one story out of 10 million you know in the united states so let's support our brothers and sisters and pray for those who are struggling but we lost 50,000 men in vietnam in a 10-year war we're losing 50,000 people a year from this opioid crisis and it's only getting worse right we need to be praying but in our country is anyone going to say things are getting better sin wise we're inventing new sins that i didn't even think existed 20 years ago when i was playing with gi joes stuff like that then jesus said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come i'm going to tell you that the entire world has heard the gospel there's not a nation on earth that has not heard the gospel some people years ago misinterpreted this that all people would become christians and then jesus would return that's not what he was saying the gospel has been preached in all nations the bible has been translated into every major language group and now they're into the sub-dialects, right? So they have 1,442 different New Testaments in different languages, you know, uh, 636 complete Bibles, but now they're going into the sub-dialects. But every nation has heard the gospel, right? We can claim that in our lifetime that that's happened in every corner. Now the re-evangelizing is occurring. America needs to be re-evangelized. In our nation, in your neighborhood, in your home, We've got to reach people with the gospel. Not everyone's called to be an evangelist, but every one of us was called to preach the gospel to those who are in our sphere of influence. I'm going to pivot a little bit, because what I'm doing is I just went off of Matthew 24. Those are the signs that Jesus said. And I just hit on this quickly, because there are so many headlines. I actually overwhelmed myself. I had to just narrow this down. But I just want to get into... Some other verses that are in the Bible talking about the signs that we would see. Please do not leave here today thinking astrology is okay. I need to make that very clear. Astrology is looking at stars and going, I think this is what's going to happen. I'm going to go buy a lottery, lottery ticket today, right? That's not right. That's trying to predict the future. But God did use his creation and the, and the sun and the moon and the stars as signs to us for various things. Okay, so you must use the Bible... Right? and what it says, and be very cautious in this. So I'm not advocating astrology any way, shape, or form. i just got to say that. But God did say in the very beginning, let the lights and the firmament, the heavens, the suns, be a sign for seasons, for signs, and for seasons, and for days and for years, so that we can keep track of, of times and when things are occurring. And in Matthew, God used the star to signal his birth, right? so that the Magi knew to go look for the, the king born of the Jews. And in the book of Joel, in the Old Testament, it says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. Okay, so now Bill's going to, I'm pivoting on this, and I'm going to own some of this, right? This is not uh, stuff that you have to say, oh boy, to be saved, I've got to believe this. It's just, it's for interest. So let's just talk about, you've seen the books and all the stuff about the four blood moons and everything. I'm just going to go over it very quickly. The blood moons occur, right, when certain things align. And the, I don't know, did any of you go out in 2015 when this was occurring? Out where I was out in Davenport, you know, the moon looked gigantic and it turned red. And, ver I, and I was thinking, I wonder if God is using this as a sign for something that's in Jewish coming. feast days. Well, like this Passover or, or uh, Feast of Tabernacles, that kind of stuff. So let's just go over three of them since 1492. They're called tetrods when that happens. In 1493 to 1494, four blood moons on four Jewish feasts. What happened? In 1492, there were a lot of Jewish people living in Spain. And the Spanish king said, you know what? No more Jews. If you're going to be Jewish, we're either going to put you to death, or you're going to convert to Christianity, or you're going to leave our land. The Spanish Inquisition. The very next day after that was to go into effect, Christopher Columbus sells and discovers the new world. They, there's speculation that Christopher Columbus was a Christian who had converted from Judaism. Right? You can read a lot of books on this, that the spelling of his name, the pronunciation, the city that he came from in Italy was uh, heavily populated by Jewish people. It's for speculation. But they do know that the navigator of his ship was a Jewish man. Right? It, it, no coincidence with God. They leave the very next day. They discover the new world. And what happens with America eventually? It becomes a haven for the Jews. It's the only safe place, you know, here and parts of South America where the Jewish people were able to have a safe haven until their own land was given back to them. 
1949, 1950 it happened, and in 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn after 1,900 years of not existing. In 1967 and 68, Jerusalem was captured. Even though they'd become a nation, the country of Jordan still owned most of Jerusalem. That's their capital, the eternal capital that God has given them. It happens again there, they get Jerusalem. Jerusalem's always God's time clock for things that he's doing. So we recently, and I, may, I just realized this when I was sitting here looking over at my notes, this should say 2014. Somehow I let that get in there. But we had a recent four blood moons. They occurred on Passover, Feast of Tabernacle, Passover, Feast of Tabernacle. And a lot of people said, see, nothing happened. That's a bunch of hooey. So let, let's just talk to see if something did happen during that time. In the month of July and August in the Jewish calendar, you have a period called Bain ha, whoops, Bain ha Mitzarim. Whoops. I won't press that button anymore. Which means the time of dire straits, right? We all heard the rock group from the 80s, dire straits. Where it's a three-week period of time where the Jews mourn and they prepare for, is something bad going to happen? Because twice in their history, the temple was destroyed on Tish B'Av. The exact day, the temple was destroyed twice. And, during, and this is the same time where the... Uh, 12 spies go out in the land and 10 of them come back and say, we can't go in there. There are giants in the land and they give a bad report at least to the rebellion and the Jews. There's all kinds of things that have occurred terrible for the Jewish people on Tish B'Av and during that three-week period of mourning. So on July 14th, 2015, the United States enters into this nuclear agreement with the number one enemy of Israel right now, Persia, Iran. We say, go ahead, and I'm not sure what we or anyone else got out of that. We gave them billions of dollars, which they now fund their terrorist organizations that are attacking Israel. They were basically told that oh, you know, they won't build nuclear weapons, but you can continue with your program, and when we want to inspect, we'll give you 40 days notice, and we'll let a lot of your own people do the inspection. I mean, it's just nothing that... You know, that would be like you're telling your child, you go up and clean your room, and then you inspect it and come and tell me, and we'll just go by whatever you tell me. We'll accept that as the gospel truth. So in the United States, in some ways, has helped now fund the number one terrorist nation in the world. But something else happened that might have, you might have missed in the headlines. This is the headline, Biblical Return of 70 Nations as Countries Gather in Paris. So... John Kerry, who was our Secretary of State at the time, along representing the United States and 69 other nations, a total of 70 nations gather in Paris to come up with a thing saying, hey Israel, you have to give up half your land to the Palestinians. Right. We just thought that would be a good idea. Even though your country is so small and it's the country that God has put his handprint on and said, that's my land, we want you to give half of it. Why 70 countries? Things don't happen for a coincidence, right? If you go back... In uh, the book of Genesis, there are 70 grandsons of Noah, and they're listed as the grandsons that then started the world over again after the flood. So in the Torah and to the Jewish people, 70 nations represents the world. Okay, Just as God spoke in 70 languages when he gave the Ten Commandments, that was to represent the world. He was given the Ten Commandments, not just to the Jewish people, but to the world. So 70 nations meet, even though there are 195 nations in the world. And what do they do? They come to condemn Israel, the whole world condemning Israel, and saying you have to give back what God's given you. That's not going to happen, right? Now we're going to go into the book of Daniel, which I encouraged you if you want to study these things. I'm just going to pick out one verse here. It says, this is the angel Gabriel, the same one who announced the birth of Jesus to Mary. He says, the ruler, the Antichrist, will make a treaty with the Jewish people for a period of one set of sevens, seven years, and after half this time, three and a half years, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. This is also mirrored in the book of Revelations, where God tells us this is going to happen. To the end to the sacrifices and offerings, the temple is built. Now, I want you to keep in mind, the first and second temple were destroyed. The first by the Babylonians, the second by the Romans. There hasn't been a temple for just about 2,000 years. So this is saying there will be a third temple, and there's other verses that allude to that. So sometime in that halfway period, the Antichrist is going to put a stop to the offerings. And if you were to continue to reading, he sets an object up in there, which is, they, some believe is an image of himself that people have to worship because he wants to be worshipped as God. Down here, 
Number three temple will be built sometime in the near future. The Apostle Paul said in Thessalonians, he was warning the, Th the Thessalonians said, hey, some people came along and said the rapture already happened. We missed it. He's like, no, 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 no. Hey, I, don't you remember I taught you this? So he reminds him, he says, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God, the great apostasy that we were talking about, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. He will exalt himself. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming he himself is God. All I wanted you to get out of that is that the third temple will be built sometime in the near future. I believe it's very, very possible the rapture will occur prior to the building of the temple. I could be totally wrong. This could happen tomorrow. But I don't want anyone sitting here going, the temple has to be built, then I'll start paying attention to what's really happening, right? Because I believe the rapture does occur before that. So here's some recent headlines. June 2016. Jewish priests, biblical status confirmed by DNA, ready to prepare for third temple. Right? You have to be from the tribe of the Levites right, to be a priest. They can't just be any old Jewish person. Do you know, and I've said this before, people that have the last name of Cohen with a K or a C, that means priest. Right? So they've kept that name for the last 2,000 years. Hey, he was from the Levitical priesthood. But through DNA, they can determine now who's of that tribe so that they don't have someone conducting services that shouldn't be in it. August 2016. First of all, the Sanhedrin has been reformulated already. For 1,900 years, that hasn't happened. It's the Jewish rulers. They appointed a high priest. All right, trivia question. Who's our high priest? Jesus, Jesus right? But the Jewish people haven't accepted yet, so they've appointed a high priest, and they already started doing some of the sacrifices and offerings even though they don't have a temple. They've studied the Bible and they say, wait, there are some offerings and sacrifices that have to occur even prior to the temple. So they're already kind of doing it off-site a little bit. But they're preparing everything. They, for decades, they've been preparing the, the priestly garments, the, um, the bowls and the vessels for the sacrifices. They have everything prepared. Okay, And now they're just doing the final touches. And if you read you know, these websites and stuff that have to do with what's happening in Israel that might not make our news. I mean, they are actively, they expect, among the Orthodox Jews, they expect Messiah to come soon. Right? They're seeing a lot of the signs of that. And here's one from just a couple of weeks ago. Israelis march demanding access to the Temple Mount and building of the Third Temple. And you can read this for yourself, but the defense minister said, Everyone who came here tonight proved with their feet that we want the temple back and quickly. Right? And this is a model that they have right by the Temple Mount of what exactly things look, need to look like. Years ago, when Benjamin Netanyahu was the prime minister the first time, because then he, he was out of office, now he's prime minister again, he was being interviewed on an American Christian station. And they said, well, tell us, how many, you guys want the temple, how many years would it take to build that? Because it took 43 years one time, and, you know. And he laughed, and he said, weeks, not years. Because they have a lot of this already prepared, and they know if something happens that allows them to build the temple, they better do it quickly. So I believe they've prefabricated what they've needed, and now they're just waiting for whatever event to occur for them to build it. And this is from July 31st. For first time in 2,000 years, Jewish priests will learn the lost laws of the Holy of Holies. I don't know if you remember in the news, two Israeli police officers were killed recently. That occurred in the area that they believe is the Holy of Holies. So that area was desecrated by the death, right? Jewish priests and stuff were not supposed to touch dead bodies or else they're ceremoniously unclean. They can't perform. So all of a sudden, now they're sitting down and going, what do we do if these things happen? So they have an organization called Zaka which will immediately come in and cleanse the area and do Jewish rituals to clean the area. And I just have this picture here from what's going to happen when the temple is rebuilt. Whoever the high priest is, that once a year when they go into the Holy of Holies to offer the sacrifices, they wear bells on their clothing and they have a rope attached to their legs so that if they should die while they're in there, nobody else can go in and get them. You can't approach the Ten Commandments, the, you know, the Holy of Holies. You pull them out. So the bells stop ringing, and you pull them out. So they're already preparing these things. They're preparing the new laws for how they're going to do this. And things are moving in that direction. I don't know when the final outcome is going to happen, but it's going to happen. So these are the life lessons that I, as I was praying about this, 
Number one, God is sovereign, and everything's going to work out according to his will. You know, I heard an analogy one time that, like, say you had booked a, a trip on a cruise ship to go from here to England. Well, you know that from here to England, you're going to get there on this date or whatever. But you don't know all the events that are going to happen on that cruise ship, right? And so similar to this, God has his time. He knows exactly when things are going to occur, but he's, we're still figuring out as things go on this journey that we're on. He's given us some indication we don't know everything that's going to happen, but he's in control. So as you see troubling headlines as a believer, rather than having fear, he's stealing my show right now. He's <laughs> I love babies. I'm sorry. Number two, Jesus did provide the signs that would signal his soon return. You know, when I get in conversations with other pastors, say from a Presbyterian church, they take a step back. You know, just, just hey, let's as pastors just talk about this. Have a good... Oh, I'm a pan-tribulation. Everything's going to pan out. I don't want to, you know, we're not supposed to talk about this stuff. They don't even really believe it. They don't, you know, I had a, a pastor who's been a pastor for 40 years come to one of my Bible studies and say, I never heard this before. This is new to me. You know, he was amazed. I'm thinking, uh, you got to be teaching the people in your own congregation. Number three, you're not just reading the Bible. You're living it. You are living in the Bible. So as you're reading it, and go, man, that must have been amazing back then when that happened. And you are living during those times that God was talking about. Isn't that amazing that you could have lived any other time in history, but he chose you to live at this time? Are you spiritually aware so that you're not deceived? So many people, it, God says, they refuse to accept the truth, so they're going to accept the falsehood, and they're going to accept the lie. So many people. But you know what? You have people in your own life family members, co-workers, friends, that you don't have to, you don't beat them over the head with the Bible, but you bring up the headlines. Hey, did you hear about blah, 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 you know? Did you hear the Jews are going to be building a temple or something, you know? And start a conversation. See if God, but more than anything, pray for them. Pray that the Holy Spirit enlightens them and helps them to believe. And then, you know what, is your own personal rapture going to happen today? None of us know what today or tomorrow holds. Are you prepared today? Right? Don't put off for tomorrow things that you need to, if you got, if God's been putting a song in your heart, man, sing it today. If he's put it on your heart to talk to somebody, do it today. Tomorrow is always Satan. Today is always the day of salvation, right? I asked Jason to play a particular t song, that strong tower, because as I was preparing this message, I just got hit with that. That's the song that we had to pray, that we had to sing. Our God is an awesome God. He is our strong tower, and we go to him for defense. And you know, I finished this sermon two weeks ago before Steve preached last week. And if you remember from Pastor Steve's thing, he kept saying, are you going to finish strong? I already had that. And I talked to him. I was like, that's amazing that I already had this as one of our life lessons. And he said, Bill, I didn't even have that prepared. It just came out today. So I'm thinking that God's telling me and you, are you prepared to finish strong in this battle? I don't care how old you are or whatever or how young you are. And we don't know God's timing, but live each day being willing to leave a legacy, being willing to finish strong, right? Don't get discouraged and, and just stop fellowshipping with people and, and fall back into old habits, right? Be strong in the spirit of the Lord. And you can't read this, but uh, it's very hard to see. It says, Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawn near, right? So as we see these things, be ever more encouraged. God has a plan, and we have eternity with him if you're a believer. If you're not, and you're here today, you know, and you're still kind of on the fence, I have somebody that I've been witnessing to for a while, and this stuff is all of interest to him, but he's on the fence, and he said, but isn't it possible people are, know this stuff, and so they're making this stuff happen? If you can believe that, your faith is much stronger than anything else. These nations and leaders and people have no idea what they're doing. When 70 nations gathered in Paris, they have no idea that it wasn't 49 or 162, right? They don't know that they're part of what's happening. They're totally ignorant to it. But we won't be ignorant to it. So let's close the prayer next week. We're going to do part two and, and pick up where we left off. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that as believers, you've shared with us, Lord. You love us that much that you, you share with us what's going to happen, Lord. You show us these things so that we won't be discouraged or fearful, that we'll always uh, trust in you, that we'll be in your strong tower, Lord, that we will uh, praise you and be ever more willing to share with others as they see terrible things happening around themselves. 
Father, I pray that you would help us to go out this week and to be willing to um, just be led by the Spirit to, to share if we need to share with someone, whether it's a physical need or, or a spiritual need. And I pray that you would surround us and our children, Lord, the, the many children that are in our Sunday school, protect, provide, and restore those of us, Lord, who are hurting. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.